Welcome back to Hogwarts Dropout Radio. We're happy that you're tuning in to yet another broadcast. I am your host, Matt Muggleton, and joining me, as always, is Reba. Hi, I'm Reba. I'm here. I'm a longtime Harry Potter scholar. Uh, I picked up the books when I was in middle school and have picked them up, put it down a lot since. But yeah, I'm a longtime Harry Potter reader. Uh, this is Matt is a first time Harry Potter initiate. What, what, what do we call you? <laughs> yeah, it, feel, it feels kind of culty. So initiate's a good time. Yeah. I'm we, joining gotten... your dark order. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, you will have to some, some, you'll have to get one of those stripy scarves. That is. Uh, like... uh, <laughs> the horror. No. <laughs> But yeah, this is a podcast uh, where we read through a few chapters of Harry Potter every week. This week, we are still in the first book and going through chapters 8 through 10. So that's the right, Potion so that... Masters, uh, the Midnight Duel, and Halloween. All right. And so very quickly, we're going to do a previously on Harry Potter. There was a boy. He was sad. Then he got some letters. He's on a train. He's going to Hogwarts. He's in Gryffindor. Ron is his friend. Draco is his enemy. This is HDR. And there are some trolls in this motherfucking dungeon. There's some trolls in this dungeon. There's some trolls in this dungeon. Okay. Okay, I don't appreciate being called a troll, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so, Sorry. we are picking up where we left off. Uh, Harry has arrived at Hogwarts. He's been sorted. We're going to get into what student life is like. And in chapter 8, we kind of start off with Harry gets into like a little bit of detail about his school life, how he finds Hogwarts layout really confusing. A ghost sometimes appears and takes your nose. I really, <laughs> I really enjoyed, like, I don't know if this was supposed to be like the ghost, because he's a ghost, he's using really weird, out-of-date slang. He says, gut your conk. Is that a thing people in Britain say? <laughs> Maybe. At one point, <laughs> but like, I've never heard that. Okay, because I always, I just, whenever anything like that turned up, when I was, I just assumed, like, ah, yes, this is normal for the British. <laughs> that sounds like something those freaks would say. Well, he's, okay, so Peeves is actually, since we're already on Peeves, already tangent, but Peeves, he's a poltergeist, he's not technically a ghost, and so he can do things that the other ghosts can't. Like, where the other ghosts are spirits of people who have passed on, and it's not really, it's not gone into what exactly the metaphysics of that is here, but you get a little bit of that later on. For Peeves, he is not the spirit of a person who passed on, he's just something that manifested in the school as, like, this spirit of chaotic evil. Oh, he's and Dennis the Menace. Yeah, exactly, he's Dennis the Menace, the entity. And that's just a thing that can happen magically you'll you'll get a poltergeist and so unlike the ghosts like normal ghosts i think that they have some power to do things but whenever we like they don't interact physically with the world uh but peeves can and peeves will do stuff like mess like he can mess with you he can mess with objects and he can do stuff like grab your nose okay so he's just like basically he's just an annoying kid who never goes away yeah he's like an annoying kid demon thing yeah I think if I was uh, in charge, if I was Christopher Columbus and I was casting the first Harry Potter film, that is a shoe in for Adam Sandler as Peeves. Oh my god, <laughs> that is. <laughs> I think I see now why they cut it because it was either you go all the way with Peeves and it's too much, or you just you don't have Peeves. Uh, yeah, uh, I just I, Peeves abuses me because it's just like I, I had this as well with like Fred and George, but like. I think they call, like, they call Ron, like, an Ickle Diddums at one point. I- Ickle like, Ronikins. And... I- I'm not sure anyone's ever said that. <laughs> but yeah, Hogwarts needs to hire an exorcist. Um, we also learn about Argus Finch, who is the caretaker and is hated by the entire student body, even though he's just trying to do his fucking job. Argus Finch, he is the most long-suffering person in the school you you don't even know the extent to which he is suffering yet uh but he's yeah it, it is like oh like you should like your janitor the janitor is a person trying to do his job with all these fucking kids without doxing myself the janitor at my high school was a survivor of the cambodian genocide oh shit <laughs> and i only found that out in my last year i was like holy fuck 
Yeah, so be be nice to your janitors. Be nice in to real your janitor, though. They might have uh, secrets. Filch is bitter. Uh, he you you understand like you'll find out later sort of why why he is as bitter as he is. But he mm. he and the students have like a kind of mutu- inevitably mutually antagonistic relationship. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, also, I, as far as I'm aware, he's the only person in like he's the only groundskeeper at this school besides Hagrid. So, if I had to clean this entire fucking castle, I'd be pretty muddy too. Yeah, like Filch is inside, Hagrid is outside. There, there are house elves, but we we don't know oh. about them yet. So let's not think about them yet. That that's oh. gonna be a, that's gonna be when 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 the house elves happen. That's gonna be like an entire episode, maybe three. Because I have <laughs> so much to say about <laughs> yeah. them, so we're not we're not touching that yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we also get like a quick rundown of different classes Harry's in. Um, I think I made this joke to you before because you were telling me about this. There's Professor Bins, who's the teacher of wizard history, who's like a ghost who is so boring he fell asleep and died in front of the fire. I think. Yes. But it's implied that he's like just kind of completely on autopilot. He's just going through the motions, and I like to think just students are sitting there, and suddenly he says like a slur from the nineteen forties, and I was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> oh god. Okay, Professor Bins, you you haven't seen like I guess you you already get sort of what his deal is. You'll though there will be occasional uh, comedic bits with how boring, how beyond the impossible boring Bins is. Hmm. And Bins is a fascinating entity that I don't think is explored enough because, well, okay, what I think happened or why I think he's still here is because it, like, he's a ghost and so it costs no money to have him still at the school. Like, he doesn't eat any food. He doesn't, he doesn't need to take any money. He's, like, a t- he's basically a teacher for free and he is teaching history which is a subject that the more traditional people at, on, like, the school board wouldn't want to have changed anyhow. Yeah. So he's just, like, this testament to, like, like, a, like he's the horror of bureaucracy in a school system where yeah. he's just, like, he's this teacher who has, like, he, he's deathly, deathly boring in life, deathly boring in death. No one at Hogwarts is, retains any history in that class, unless you are Hermione and you put extra effort into doing so. And the history he is teaching is at least a century out of date. And, <laughs> like... So Hermione's you... gonna have some real fucked up views about the Irish after a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is... Keeps giving, Se- keeps giving Seamus Finnegan the stink eye. Oh god, everything, just everything about Bins' existence is hilarious, is hilariously terrible when you interrogate it at all. And I don't think that's that's not a mistake to me, like in the Harry Potter universe. Mm. That's just kind of like, like I don't know. It, it's just oh, well, there's a lot about the Wizarding world, especially sort of in this sort of introduction to it, where it's not presented as like this across the board good thing, or like there's not like Hogwarts is not it's not heaven. There's a lot of aspects of it that are annoying or a problem, or I mean, it's all just kind of in the mix of magical shit. Like the whole yeah. thing with the with the changing stairs, where you have like you sometimes there will be doors that aren't doors but are walls just pretending, and it's just like <laughs> fuck you, Hogwarts. I really, I but, really like, I really like the uh, the fake stairs that you have to hop over. Just how many kids have lost teeth for those? Oh my god, it is just yeah. Like Hogwarts is kind of a death trap, but that's part of why it's fun. <laughs> Yeah, Bins is kind of like, what if what if showing your class a DVD because you're hungover was an existential nightmare? <laughs> yes! Exactly! That is exactly what he is. Uh, and it's great, and, like, Hogwarts badly needs an exorcist for two reasons. One is Peeves, the second one is Bins. Mm. We then also have Professor Flitwick, who... We don't even get much of him, but I just like him already. I just mm. have a... I have a strong image of who he is in my head. And I just enjoy yeah. him. The idea of a little man falling off his chair because he finds out Harry Potter's in his class. Excellent. <laughs> he, uh, we also a... get... Oh, sorry. You got... No, I was just kind of like, yeah, he's like... I All of the teachers, even though many of them aren't like super in focus, like Flitwick, he's very much a side character. But uh, that's part of like... 
everything's so colorful in the characters. Like he, like they're all very distinct. Like you have Flitwick, who's the little guy, uh, who. Hey, I'm the little guy. I'm the little birthday boy. <laughs> Professor Flitwick, and then you have like Professor Sprout, who's got like, you know, uh, dirt in her hair and things, and is mm. you know like the the stout uh, herbology teacher. And then you have McGonagall, who's very strict, and she's like the math teacher. And then you have Snape, who is a situation. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, it's very fitting that Flickwick teaches what he does, considering how charmed I am by him. A- yeah, yeah, everyone is very appropriate, and they all have names that are very appropriate. Like, Flitwick could not be teaching herbology. He's obviously teaching charms. Yeah. Uh, we also get on to McGonagall, who's, like, given a little bit more. I think, I think I'm onto something when I say, I think McGonagall is, like, if Hermione is kid J.K. Rowling insert, McGonagall is adult Rowling insert. Mmm. I ah. think this is, this is, like, J.K. Rowling, like, if she was in a story, this is who she'd want to be. I would not be surprised by that. I think that McGonagall is a bit more stern than Rowling herself, but, I like, McGonagall has this kind of very, like, you know, stern teacher, like, mm, no-nonsense thing. And that's never been quite a part of Rowling's pub- public persona. But McGonagall does have these sides. Like, she's very inf- She cares a lot about the Quidditch team at the school. And yeah. she'll, like, she, 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 like, she shakes her, her finger at Fred and George. But she also is kind of, she likes them. And she finds what they do, uh, like, amusing as much as if it, it is troublemaking. Uh, in like the adventures they get up to, and she's like I I, I think that, that that's maybe not entirely wrong. Um, a little bit more like again that the kind of the sternness with McGonagall is something that hasn't, to my knowledge, hasn't really been a part of Rowling's persona. Rowling's much more kind of mysterious than mm. McGonagall is, but I can I can kind I can see aspects of that in the ways that she's more like. Sort of like a, like the the layer underneath that with her character. I was gonna make a uh, a side that like oh she reminds me of the Countess from Downton Abbey. Uh, that's because she's played by the same actress. Ah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned that people sometimes look the same as themselves. It's I it, it's amusing to me that you are like the last person on earth to learn this information. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Dad's and Abby plays a fair bit in my household, but I don't really retain any information from it. Oh, I see. I see that that's the situation you're in. <laughs> yeah. We also get like uh, a quick little aside on Quirrell, how like everyone expected his class to be really hardcore, and he's actually just this guy weird guy who's scared of everything. Everything stinks of garlic. I'm starting to think this guy might actually be Wario. Mm. Apparently. He, he tells a, a interesting story about getting his turban from an Egyptian guy, um, which is, I feel like in the modern version, he'd be telling that to explain why it's not racist for him to wear it. Yes! I, citation needed on Quirrell's turban being a gift from an African prince. I, I, just, I just took that as a lie, to be yeah. honest. I just took that as a lie. But yeah, um... We then cut to sort of the next morning, Harry and Ron are having breakfast, and uh, Harry gets a note from Hagrid inviting him to have some tea with him later and sort of talk about his first week. Um, and, you know, I think it's time to, you know, we've, we've been, I think I've been enjoying the book so far, but it's time to take the kitty gloves off. When Ooh, we start okay. this scene, Harry is established to be eating porridge, but later on it said that Hagrid, Hagrid? Hedwig drops the note onto his plate. Which is it, Rowling? Are you expecting me <laughs> to believe that Harry was eating his porridge on a plate like a moron? Ding. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe he's eating it like it's a bowl, and then he puts a bowl on top of a plate for spillage. Oh, fuck, yeah, you could be doing that. Eh, headcanon fairy. Uh, uh, and you're like, that's kind of an anal thing to do. He was raised by Anne Petunia! <laughs> I'll get you next time, Rowling. <laughs> next time. Um, yeah, it's time to go to potions class, which they are sharing with Slytherin. Double potions. Um, double bubble. Mm-hmm. They have to go to the dungeon for this, which feels appropriate for Snape to live in a basement. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, you already, like, he has such a reputation as the incel, uh, to end all incels, that... Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, pretending that we've been keeping up with this whole pretense the entire time, we of course both went to Hogwarts and dropped out, and I remember Snape was a big ol' incel when I went. <laughs> anyway, so, so, anyway, so, we, so we're meeting Snape. How, what is your impression yes. of Snape? Um, bit of a chode. Bit of a chode. Yeah, he just sort of, we, we get, he, he just picks on Harry quite a lot during his lesson. I get the impression, that honestly, if it wasn't for these, like, weird grudges, he'd be a pretty good teacher. Mm. Strangely. They mentioned that he, like, has the attention of the class, um, and, like, no one talks over him. And also, he clearly has, like, a, a passion for the subject. He's into potions. He has a whole little speech about them. Yeah. And he, like, just from a glance knows what Neville does wrong when he fucks up his. Yeah. Like, he's very good, like, in the technical aspects of his subject. He's a very good teacher. Um, it's just that he's he's terrible to children, and that's a problem for being a teacher. <laughs> or he's... Yeah, I think... Yeah, like, he, he's terrible. He, he's shitty to Harry, but he's also picks on Neville in a particular way. Um, yeah. Which, yeah, like... I think Snape, Snape would do well in a higher learning environment. Yes. Yeah, if he was at a college. Oh. Although, no, I think he tried to pick up students. Oh, no! Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. oh God. I would hope... No, I don't know. He's... He's such <laughs> an encrusted, Byronic r- romance guy. Maybe, ho- hopefully he wouldn't, but who knows. Uh, the problem is, the problem is as well. He's exactly the sort of gu- guy like a university age girl making a bad decision would go for. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, he is, and that is oh, no. that, that is exactly the foundation of Snape Hermione fix. What? Jesus! That is a whole wing of the Harry Potter fan fiction world. Fucking lord. Okay. Anyways, moving swiftly on. I guess I do have something to mention here, which is that in Snape's little opening bit where he's, he gives this very lyrical uh, description of what potions mean to him, and then he says, if you aren't the bunch of dunderheads I usually have to teach. Uh, uh. <laughs> and the use of the word dunderheads, I find kind of, like, I know this is supposed to be like, oh, this is how he's nasty. I don't, like, maybe to 11-year-olds, that sounds nasty, but... To me, reading that as an adult, it's, like, almost affectionate. Like, if you aren't a bunch yeah. of idiots, as I usually have to deal with. But it's it's kind of playful Snape. Like, he doesn't completely hate children. Shout out to Hermione. You aren't a dunderhead. You're doing great. I just like that. I, like, I, I did find that line funny where she was, like, desperate to prove she wasn't a dunderhead. Yes, Hermione. You are not a dunderhead. Also, Harry's little, like, Harry's little, like, when Snape is picking on him and trying to make him give answers to questions he doesn't know, and he's like, oh, I think Hermione might know. <laughs> it's like, hey, bit of answer. Yeah, that was, like, that was an example, I think, of, like, the, the, the walking back to the stairs after someone said something to you and you, you thought of something later. A little bit of that, but, like, Harry can be, like, I think that that's, like, a realistic or a good amount of sass. He, oh, this is like a, this is very much a cultural reference for British people, unless you happen to have watched this show, but there's a sitcom called The Inbetweeners. Nope. Where the main character is, he's this posh, dorky guy who obviously has a lot of trouble with, like, being picked on and not being very popular, but he does have this thing of, like, he is pretty, he is pretty clever, and he does have, like, pretty good comebacks, but he always says them under his breath. Hmm. It does kind of remind me of that a little bit. Yeah. You know what he even looks a little bit like Harry Potter. Interesting. Hmm. There's only so many specky British kids. So many models of that. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, mo- so the, 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 there's Snape. And we're moving on from Snape. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we go to Hagrid's, Hagrid's house. Um, important to note, he has a fucking crossbow on his front door. <laughs> yes. Hagrid's packing. Hagrid is packing. Well, there, there's shit in the Forbidden Forest that he has to contend with. And if that's what he keeps on the front door, why does he keep it in the gun cabinet? Jesus. Hagrid's <laughs> <laughs> got, like, a fucking blunderbuss. I would not be shocked. I think, like, crossbow... Like, I, I think guns would function at Hogwarts, but nobody has them. And a crossbow is mm. more, like, you know, older 
kind of technology. If you like feed a wand through a wood chipper and put a, like a little splinter of each bit of it into an arrow, uh, I think that would be a very efficient magical weapon. Mm. Lots of things to play around with there. Yeah, I he used his wand to become an umbrella. Maybe he should have used it for like parts of the crossbow instead. Uh, he invites both Ron and Harry inside, and like he has this like. In an area, you know, a metaphor so obvious, JK even fucking just says it. Like, he has a big, scary dog that's actually friendly and nice. <laughs> uh, he's, he serves them rock cakes made with actual rock. Uh, it, that's not written in the text, but I'm going to assume so. <laughs> well, yeah, they said, are rock cakes a thing? I never knew what rock cakes are. Yeah, I think... The thing is, they look like rocks, is the idea. Like, they're quite roughly made little uh, pastries. Mm. But they, they're very soft when you actually eat them. Oh. They're not supposed to be hard. But his are very hard, and so they probably are yeah. just rock. <laughs> yeah, he's just, he's just painting rocks like the color of cake. Okay. <laughs> this is a Hagrid prank. <laughs> uh, okay, but yes. Uh, Hagrid calls Finch a wanker because he's unsympathetic to his fellow workers' plight. No, no camaraderie um, at Hogwarts. And sort of, he, he 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 sort of dodges the question when Harry brings up that Snape doesn't like him, and he's like, Snape, upstanding guy. Why would he not like you? Is that what he says, or does he say? Uh... No, he's not. He's not that. He's obviously he doesn't lay it on that thick. But he's like, there's no reason for Snape to not like you. Yeah, he's always just like, ah, Snape's just a, a jerk. That's what that's what people tend to say when when Harry's like, Snape seems to hate me very specifically, and it's like, no, nah, he's just he's just yeah. There, there's no there's no other reason for this. Nonsense. You're not a woman. <laughs> I, f- I forget where they get the newspaper from, but they also have, like, a newspaper article about a Gringotts uh, break-in into the same vault that Harry and Hagrid withdrew the Nuts magazines from. So clearly these things are in high demand <laughs> because someone was trying to burgle them. Yeah. So I think we can, like, do a little bit overview here because, like, we doing your kind of like... But so, like, the, the whole situation with the mystery of the story, uh, how do you feel that's... That that's going as it's unfolding, like, because that is sort of half of what this is, is that it's, uh, there's a mystery afoot. I don't know, are, are you a fan of mystery stories, or, like, how, how do you feel about that? I, I, I do love a Columbo. Um, I think the mystery, like, obviously, because I have seen the movie, I do remember that, spoiler alert, it's Quirrell. Quirrell's the criminal. He's the one behind everything. Um, and I feel like... Even at this point, you could probably, if you were a pretty, like, sharp kid, you could have figured that out. There's plenty of stuff that points to him being suspicious, and Snape's a bit obvious. Mm, yeah. And... Like, already we've kind of planted seeds. Yeah, it is, like, like baby's first uh, mystery. Um, I think that there's a lot of bits that are kind of... Uh, like, okay, so the whole bit where after they, they, they see the trap door, and it's like, oh, the, the dog is guarding something. And Harry immediately puts, like, the two things together. And it's like, ah, that dog is obviously guarding the little package. Does that seem like kind of a leap in logic to you? That's that's leaping ahead in the narrative a bit, Reba. Sheesh. But yeah. Um, <laughs> I I could buy it as something, like, maybe a kid would put together. Yeah. Like, um, it, it happens to be that he is right. And it it's also, like, plausible that a kid would kind of be like, ah, these, like... The, the, my world is small enough that these things must be connected. Um, and he just happens to also be right. But it is... Yeah, because my first guess of where, you know, Dumbledore's keeping the wizard paw now is probably in a vault under his bed. But <laughs> I guess in this case... Yeah, because like, like in later books, that kind of thing, uh, when there's a lot more moving parts going on, and it's like, oh, there's a dog that's guarding something. What that thing is could be like one of like like 15 different things. It doesn't, like, mm. you, the, that one-to-one. But there's only really, there's only one MacGuffin that we have so far. And it's like, ah, this is the only thing, there's only one thing that's been plot-relevant to me, and therefore that is what it mm. must be, is the, is the deduction that Harry makes. <laughs> yeah, and it's even, like, if you're paying attention, it's even the setup of, like, Snape, we have no, we haven't established that he who was on the scene at the time, whereas we know Quirrell was in Diagon Alley that day. Yes, yeah, we have. 
So I think definitely, like, if, if, if you're a sharp kid reading this, it's not the world's most difficult mystery, but you probably you could have figured it out by now. Yeah. There's enough clues being left. Yeah, I know. I forget if it was surprising when I first read it. I think that I wasn't quite, like, I don't know. I, I just kind of, like, bulldozed through it. And so I don't remember if I was, like, trying to figure out the mystery or if I was just kind of, like, like going through such a breakneck pace I didn't consider it. Uh, I, I think I think I'd say like it's less a mystery story and more a story about a mystery. If you get mm, me, I can see that. Yeah, it's not like a Columbo to bring it back in again as the detective show. I like where like the whole thing is about the process of figuring it out. It's more sort of while passively living like their lives at Hogwarts, they find these clues and put it together. Yeah, then that, yeah, that's what it is uh, as of yet. Yeah. Um. But yeah, Harry Hagrid is also like very cagey about this, uh, probably just for the benefit of like keeping those keeping Ron and Harry safe at this point, mm-hmm. which is fair enough. And he gives them some rock cakes for the road that they are going to lovingly share with Malfoy. <laughs> so that's uh, that's chapter eight. Um, so we move in to chapter nine. Uh, chapter nine is sort of mainly centered about the first like Quidditch. Um, I don't think Quidditch, the first broom practice yeah. for the first years. So we have Madame Hooch. Um, Clearly who I remember. <laughs> I think it's funny that, like, I remember her from the movie, but the memory has kind of been a bit overwritten by Dr. Ark from Into the Spider-Verse, who is another very lesbian character. Wait, I am so confused by most of what you've said. What? Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay, now I'm back. Now I'm back. Now I'm back. No, now I'm not. Who Whose memory has be, been overwritten? Okay, okay. This is not going to be great for the benefit of listeners, but I'm going to quickly send you... I'm going to quickly send you, like, two pictures to explain what I mean. Okay. Oh! And then... Oh, she's a goggles lesbian! That's what you're trying to say. I think I was also getting her, like, mixed up with another person from the Harry Potter movies, but yes. do you kind of see why they kind of blended together? Oh, I see what you are saying, yes. Okay, so for what he just sent me, look up Madame Hooch in the movies with the goggles on, and then look up Doc Ock from Spider-Verse with her goggles on. And yes, that yes, that is a specific, uh, a specific lesbian aesthetic involves giant goggles. And mm. yes, vaguely either steampunky or sci-fi, thing going on i'm I'm not sure like madame hooch there there is like an there is a strain of steampunk in some of harry potter uh just because like you know you got trains you got there there's a little bit of a suggestion like when it when it leans a bit more towards like uh victorian era stuff as opposed to medieval stuff you get kind of like stuff like goggles I figured out, and I'm going to put the, leave this in just to explain this. For the benefit of the listeners, I'll make the episode art, that picture of Madame Hooch, to make it a little bit easier. Okay, I think that... I'll, I'll figure it out. I think that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, 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 yeah. Also, yeah, very lesbian. Goggles are lesbian-coded. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you like to elaborate on that? Uh, Madame Hooch being a lesbian? I feel like I don't have yes. to. It's just like she... <laughs> <laughs> like, she just showed... Like, in the same way that, like, Flitwick is self-evidently the charms teacher, Madame Hooch shows up and she is self-evidently a lesbian. And he, uh, there's been a lot of headcans over the years of, like, oh, is she uh, McGonagall's girlfriend? And, of course, because Rowling has to... Has to has to be Rowling. When Rowling did her whole uh, the McGonagall lore which no one needed nor asked for. I don't know, maybe some people asked for that, but it was straight McGonagall lore, which I'm sure no one asked for. Um, uh, so maybe uh, Madame Hooch is with Professor Sprout instead. I, I think that, that would kind of be, like you got like an air and earth thing going on there. I see. Also, her, her, na- her name is Hooch, come on. <laughs> oh, that's also funny to me because Hooch is like, um, is a brand of Alcopop in the UK. <laughs> okay. So I just imagined her showing up sourced. All right, like that, blackout that works. drunk. That works. <laughs> yeah. It's like the sort of thing that like uni students drink. Yeah, I don't know where Hooch comes from, but I like it. It has a vaguely falconry sound to it. Madame Jagerbomb. Madame Hooch, flying lessons. Continue. 
yeah, she like there's a little bit of a, like this is throughout these three chapters. I should establish that like whenever there's a chance for Harry to make a dig at Draco, it's there. Like yes, <laughs> they're really selling this whole this, these two fucking hate each other. Yeah, because um, Malfoy's already ridden the broom, but of course, ah, oh, Madame Hooch points out that he's been mounting it incorrectly this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I on on that vi- okay so. You, you are well aware that there's a whole subset. There's a whole wing of the the sphere that ships Harry and Draco. Uh, how are you standing with that so far? <laughs> um, Bizarre. Bizarre to me right now. Because it seems to just be like... Uh, I get like, like the James Bond and like Bond villain kind of dynamic with this like hate, hate love thing. But with these two, it's just like it's just two boys who have like a pretty petty hatred of each other. I don't really. Okay. <laughs> they just don't like each other. Okay. I, 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 I when I when I've read this in the other times I have read it, I've never gone that route with things. I've always just kind of been like, all right, you fan. I, I, I never saw it. Uh, this time though, it's. I don't, I don't exactly see it, see it, but it is. I find Draco's motivations in this because I am now reading him. Like, why does he hate Harry? What what was the catalyst for this? And the reason he hates Harry is not the same reason he's he's obnoxious to other people. Like he's like when he's obnoxious to Neville, it's because like oh Neville's kind of overweight and not very and has struggles in school. So of course Draco picks on him. Or with Ron, it's like oh your family's poor and I'm going to be a shit about that. With Harry, it's because Harry rejected his friendship. Mm. Draco Malfoy is a woman scorned, and he <laughs> like I don't, I don't know if he if it's if it's like in that way, but just sort of like you rejected my friendship, and I will never forgive you. I will try to get you expelled now. Like <laughs> hell hath no fury, like a Tory scorn. Hell hath no fury, like a Draco Malfoy who, who whose friendship you turned down. And from Harry's perspective, it's like this guy just. Like, I thought he was a shit, and the shitness has increased exponentially. And, he, mm. like, he responds to that. And I like how, like, they are, as a rival, Draco is delightful when read through that lens. And Harry also, like, like the, the personalness of it is kind of reciprocated. Like, like, Draco will, like, he makes note when Harry's not getting a lot of packages at school and things. Like, it is very, like, they are on opposite sides of the cafeteria. They basically never have reason to interact, like, outside of potions with Snape. Because they don't have that many classes together. But, but, but yet, the, the... The sheer, the sheer force of pettiness. The sheer force of pettiness. And, like, especially with, with Draco, it feels like you, you rejected my friendship. And you did it very meanly. Like, he was like... Like, I forget how exactly Harry put it, but he just kind of, like, he tells him very directly, like, you don't, I don't, Shut him down. I'm rejecting your friendship because I don't like you, like, <laughs> mm. and, like, Harry, was, like, like, sees Malfoy's face when he's like, I have to be, like, I, I don't want him to be smug, like, I don't want him to best me, so I'm going to go do a stupid thing, and it's, like, I, I'm not sure if I would say it's necessarily ship- Material, but I find it very engaging as a relationship. This rivalry. Yeah, I think it's interesting, but I just, <laughs> I don't know. To me, like, it, it comes from people who's who who took their mum saying, "Oh, the reason that lad's picking on you is because he likes you a bit too seriously." Mm. I think yeah, that, that that's probably true. I don't. I wouldn't like. As it is right now, I would not say, oh yeah, oh, this is obviously, like, repressed feelings. I think it's fairly, like, everything, they're 11, everything's kind of operating on the level of friendship right now. Like, Ron and Hermione have their thing. But as of right now, it's just kind of like, yeah, it's just, like, friendship. It's either you're friends or you're not friends. And with Harry and Draco, Draco wanted to be friends, and Harry said no friends. And so now Draco is, I will get you expelled for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, we, we've gotten a bit sidetracked, but yeah, like, um, the Quidditch lesson is, I keep saying Quidditch lesson, the, the flying lesson. You can have uses for flying besides Quidditch, <laughs> even though you would kind of be hard-pressed to find them. Yeah. Um, 
Neville, he fucks up. Ne- Neville dies. Ne- <laughs> Neville, <laughs> this episode is a memoriam of Neville Longbottom. He's he's passed away. <laughs> he he flies straight up in the air, uh, about twenty feet, and falls off his wand and breaks his wrist. Which, the thing with like the Neville slapstick stuff is so far all of it's been like a bit too <laughs> fucking graphic to be funny. <laughs> Yeah, I I don't know if that was I don't think that was supposed to be funny, or I mean it's funny because it's Neville and Neville keeps fucking up, but it's not. It, in potions, like he like spill he like makes like acid in his pot and it gets all over his skin, and it's like this is horrible. <laughs> Poor child, getting chemical burns. It's okay, just just magic that shit away. Give him a po- give him a, a healing potion. Yeah, um, I, I'm impressed that somehow at Hogwarts there is nothing they can do about a kid, like, on day one not knowing how to operate a broom, and they just have to watch him fall. <laughs> yeah, okay, that was very... I guess, like, it must have happened too fast, and she didn't react quickly enough. Like, there are spells that you are introduced to later that, like, a capable wizard should be able to make someone float gently to the ground by just, like, saying a spell and having them do that. Like, we, we see Dumbledore use it in other times. It's, it's not even that hard. But I think, I don't know, it just happened really quickly. And she didn't... She's wearing the, uh, she's wearing the goggles, and those, those things are actually pretty useful <laughs> to see through. Yeah. So, I, I don't know. And she just didn't react quickly. Or maybe she was like, ah, yes, he will demonstrate the, the, the dangers of broomstick flying. And he probably won't get that <sighs> hurt. <laughs> The running theme in this episode is Hogwarts is a uh, lawsuit waiting to happen. <laughs> yes. While while she takes her, uh, Neville off to the hospital ward, her mouth like grabs Neville's present from his grandma, his remember all, and makes off with it. And um, I think he's like planning to like drop it in a tree or something. Yeah, he just uh, yeah. And Harry has his big damn hero moment. He steps up to the plate. He's not fucking having this, and he. Hops in a broom and, like, immediately finds he's a complete natural. He's way better than Malfoy. He even manages to, like, death dive and grab the Rememberall out of the air right before it hits the ground and shatters. Yeah. And this is something that I, like, kind of rolled my eyes at a bit. That's fair. You want to talk a bit bit about that? Especially because the rest of this chapter kind of keeps laying it on quite thick. They're really, like, oh my god. Harry Potter is the greatest seeker we've ever seen in our lives. He's such a natural prodigy. He's the youngest we've ever had. He might even be better than Charlie Weasley. It's kind mm. of like... Yeah. I get that it doesn't apply to everything in Harry's life at Hogwarts. Like, he's not, like, a crazy good student or anything. But I did, I did just kind of find myself rolling my eyes a bit at, like... Oh, but he's the most specialist boy, <laughs> and he is... <laughs> He's so good at this. No one ever expected it, but he's he's just the best. Yeah, it is. And there's not really an explanation. It's just kind of like, oh, his dad was really great at it. And it genetically passed down that he is also instinctively amazing at flying on brooms somehow. And it is. Yeah, it, it is pretty ridiculous. I yeah, which I my my dad my dad is quite a good driver, and anyone who's ever gotten a lift from me will testify that has not been passed down. <laughs> no, that doesn't. That's not how genes work. Uh but I personally, I tend to be more forgiving of that whole thing just because he's so, you know, like just just kind of a kid. Otherwise, um, hmm. like he like like he said, it's not. Uh, up until the the whole bit with Quidditch, he's been very much like you know very average, normal, like capable, but not nothing spectacular when it comes to his presence at Hogwarts. And the being good, being like a prodigy at Quidditch, is going to give him access to like the whole world of Quidditch stuff that he wouldn't have at eleven otherwise. Uh, but I don't know. That, yeah. That's how you wrote the story. You could have written it that he's just like kind of good, and they're like, hey, freshmen are allowed on the team because Hogwarts has no standards for safety. (laughs) (laughs) Which has been well established otherwise. I suppose you could also see it as, like, everyone's just trying to gas him up a bit because he's good and they want him to, like, join the team. Mm, I I could kind of see that where, like, what he does is very impressive. It it is impressive. 
for someone who's you know it's your first time on a broom and all that, all that, all that. but it's not like hmm. you you are the the bobby fisher of quidditch it's more like i don't I, like i could kind of see that the other characters are like this is an orphan kid he comes with this terrible situation he's harry potter and you know like he's doing okay in school uh but you know like i could see like the teachers are all kind of keeping an eye on him uh and so when it's like oh he's really taking to this quidditch thing and where he hasn't quite taken to anything else yet it's like okay let's really let's gas him up let's give him this what do you think riding a broom would be like i'm imagining like trying to ride a firework Mm, maybe i don't know i've never quite thought i think i would be one of the people who's terrified of it honestly like i'm not I, I'm not good with... I think maybe one sensible would be. Yeah, I'm not good with bikes. I'm not good with cars. <laughs> I'm not good with any kind of vehicle that's not just me. Really. I, I you, you can't get yeah, me on I a can't... Segway. <laughs> Embarrassing. I can't ride a bike, but I can. I'm okay driving a car. Okay, you, you um, also can't ride a bike. Yeah, I can walk yeah. for days. I can walk up any mountain you want me to, but you cannot make me bike. Uh, so yeah, I think I would definitely be ground bound when it comes to flying uh yeah we'd be we, we, we both break our necks yeah we'd both be the chumps uh we, we'd both be like hermione probably mcgonagall shows up and like she makes a show out of telling off harry because what he did was like against the rules but really she grabs um uh what's his name oliver wood yes who he's a fifth year but for some reason i kept reading it as a burly five-year-old and i found that <laughs> image quite funny <laughs> But yeah, he grabs. She grabs the cat, the captain of uh, Gryffindor's Quidditch team, finds an empty classroom, and is like, "Look, Harry, you're not actually in trouble as long as you join the Quidditch team. I'm blackmailing you." And that is some the fun of McGonagall. Yeah, and she even like like she you know she's gonna pull a few levers, get him a special broom. I there's the Nimbus five thousand, which he actually gets. Nimbus Nimbus, Nimbus two thousand. Oh, Nimbus 2000. I wasn't even close. <laughs> um, they also mention the Clean Sweep 7, which I think that just sounds like an actual vacuum cleaner. That does sound like a vacuum cleaner. Honestly, they all sound like vacuum cleaners. Like, the Nimbus 2000 does, like, the 2000 part. Like a very, uh, like, like a vacuum cleaner from, like, the 60s, when we're trying to beat the Soviets with our vacuum cleaners. <laughs> Of course, uh, Hogwarts has actually been around so long. That's not, like, a brand name. That's actually the 2000th Nimbus model. You know, that's probably true. That would make sense. We've really we've really worked. We've, we've been in the wind tunnel and gotten the bristles really aerodynamic on this one. <laughs> and Clean Sleeps... Oh, wait, that would make, like, Nimbus 2000. Like, that company has been around since the dawn of time. And meanwhile, the Clean Sweep 7 brand is new, and that's why there's only seven of them. Oh... And actually, yeah, Clean Sweep actually is a vacuum cleaner. It's a it's a flying vacuum cleaner. Oh my God. That's why it's only been seven. That that is hilarious. That, that is definitely intentional. <laughs> you you use the Hoover nozzle. It's like a thrust. You can point it. It's way more maneuverable. Oh my God! I the, the flying vacuum cleaners. There, I'm sure that there are. Maybe maybe that's in America. They they fly on vacuum cleaners. <laughs> Uh, there's um, a brand of Hoover in the UK called a Henry Hoover, which is, they're just industrial vacuums with a smiley face on them, but they've really captured the imagination. Mm. And I would really like that to be my Quidditch, like, mount. Okay. I guess you would ride it like, a, basically, just like a Segway, where you, like, stand on it, and then it goes. Yeah, because they're, they're, like, flat and circular, so you could sit on it and ride it around. Mm. Okay, but what happens when, when you get a Roomba? What is the Roomba in this... I guess Ooh. no. Those are like you. You put them on your feet, and then you, like, it's like skates, but for flying. Maybe, the, maybe, maybe, like in the high tech age of Quidditch, the Roomba is like the AI ref. Mm. It's like flying. It's flying itself around. Okay, I don't know where we've gone with this, but I like. I, I like the place we went. Anyhow, this is a fun <laughs> tangent. Did you have the? Do you have those people who play like real life Quidditch? Yes. And- uh, I've the seen States. them. I've never comprehended it or tried to interrogate it much. I know that the way that they do it is that, like, the quaffle is a real ball, and then the bludgers are two people, and then the snitch is a person, and you have to catch the person. Yeah. Um. Also, like, obviously, because humans can't actually fly, 
uh, magic isn't real, get over it. Yes. You have to just hold, not even a broomstick, I don't think, just a pole between your legs. I think that they do do that, which is the dumbest thing. I'm sorry to people listening who play Quidditch, but no, just... Let no, just just run around. This is I. <laughs> this is not a sport. This is not a sport designed for people with testicles. No, that sounds awful. <laughs> that sounds so painful. I I assume that the Quidditch equipment comes with a cod piece that like, you know. Oh, it's like doing cricket. Jesus. <laughs> oh my god. Anyhow. I think people, Americans love to make fun of uh, the absurdity of Quidditch. Unfortunately, having played cricket uh, at a club for a few years, it's not that weird. It's not that absurd. Okay, okay. so this is, do we, do we want to get into like the, the bullshit of Quidditch? How do you, see, I'm not a sports person, really. And I've always been, like, I accept Quidditch as part of the thing and what's going on. I've never been super enthused about it. Like, I care about it only to the extent that like the characters, like, persuade me that this is relevant to them um and like the whole bit with like oh and harry is the special boy and so you get the special the special role on the team where you catch the one and you get 150 points and it wins and lose like it i i i'll throw this out there like when wood explains the rules like I was ready to be charitable i know it's like a pretty hack joke to make fun of quidditch Mm -hmm. being like a shit sport but I had been running with the assumption that when you catch the snitch, yeah, it's like a million bajillion points, but like, it's so hard to do, it doesn't happen in most games. But then he says explicitly, that is how you end the game. The game keeps going for days at a time sometimes. And I'm like, okay, yeah, then everything else really doesn't matter. So, so, you're not quite wrong. Uh, but we do see it like a... Uh... In one of the, the later books, we'll, you'll see a professional game of Quidditch where the guy who catches mm. the snitch does not win the game. It just ends it. Uh, and you right. get the 150 points, but they're so but they're far enough behind that it doesn't uh, it doesn't matter. Like it, when you get on higher levels when people are scoring lots of things, the 150 points may not necessarily decide things one or the other. And so part of the thing with the snitch is that there's timing to it. Where if you're far enough behind, you don't actually want to catch it yet. Because you want your team to be able to come back, because catching it will end the game. Um, and there's a whole there, thing with, like... There is... Mm. I'm seeing a fundamental issue here, though, right? In which you have to know a little bit of maths to be able to figure out, like, will catching the snitch win us the game at this moment? Should I do it? Yeah. Uh, which is difficult when you're doing a sport especially a magical sport like this one, and there's a lot of head trauma involved. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you can expect Quidditch players to be able to do that, like, quick 150 plus or minus in their head. Uh, I mean, that's that's the challenge of it. That's the game. Uh, they're, they're, like, I don't know. It's So I think that, like, the, the Quidditch... The, the, the Quidditch is broken the way that it is, but it wouldn't take that much to fix it. Like, if it was just, instead of 150 points, if it was just 50 points, or even just, like, you get an extra 30 points, and it ends the game, Mm. that would be better. Because it's like, okay, you get a cap off, and there's, it will help you, it will help you if you are already on the path to winning, or it can, it can break a tie, but it, it won't guarantee you a win, if you're, yeah, yeah. And, or even just, like, if you got rid of the points and just said that if you catch the snitch, you end the game. If that's it. Then that changes everything, because that means that the Seeker's job is mostly math. And the Seeker's job is mostly, like, it's almost, that, that, that would make it almost, like, the worst position on the team for what you're responsible for. And yes. part of your thing is that you have to make sure that the other guy, if the, if the, if the other guy catches it, and that ends the game when it's a good time for his team, you then have to be like, oh, shit, I have to make sure he doesn't catch it before I do. Uh, But yeah, so Quidditch, yeah, I think we are, Quidditch is broken, but I think that, how how much do you think Quidditch, as it is presented to us, is a piss take on cricket or, like, actual British sports? The one thing is that, like, there's a lot more assault coded into Quidditch, which doesn't really factor into any British sport besides rugby. And it's rugby is like less silly a sport than something like cricket or rounders. 
So it kind of feels like it's almost splitting the difference between those two. Because Quidditch, as it's written in the book, basically we get the weakest, smallest boy, and we put him on a broom, and we tell everyone to try and assault him. (laughs) (laughs) You tell them, you see Harry Potter, you see how he's malnourished, knock him the fuck out. I I think that, like, you know how, how we talked about wizard money? Where the wizard money is kind mm-hmm. of a piss take on the shilling and all of that stuff. Um, I wonder to the extent that Quidditch was never meant to function. Or was never, like, not quite meant to be taken seriously as it was first written. And then subsequently it's had to be like, okay, now we have to take this seriously as a world building element. And when you look at it sideways for any amount of time, it's like, oh, wait a second, this is a completely broken sport. Um yeah, I think the answer we're looking for is that J.K. Rowling, and fair enough to her, is a nerd and does not know much of sports. That is probably true. That is definitely true. Ah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she, yes, this is if Hermione wrote a sport. Ah. Uh, no. Lord. <laughs> um... The only sort of closing note on this chapter I have is that, like, part of the reason McGonagall wants to sign Harry... Oh no, there's a little bit more. We have to talk about the Midnight Part of the reason... Yes. Part of the reason McGonagall wants to sign Harry is because um, Gryffindor's team sucks, and uh, as with everything at Hogwarts, like, Slytherin keeps winning. Mm -hmm. She can't even look at Snape after last year's House Cup, but actually, (laughs) I think that's just because he's so fucking ugly. (laughs) I like the working, the relationship that McGonagall and Snape have as colleagues. And that is, like, oh, they, like, they they have that kind of rivalry, but I think that they do, like, respect each other as teachers enough. Yeah, the implication is, like, with them it's more just, yeah, like, like a friendly rivalry rather than, like, how he takes it out in the students, where he's a horrible old kid. Like, the way Harry hears it is that, oh, Snape. We have to beat Snape and the Slytherins. The way McGonagall, I think, is saying is that, like, oh, my, my, my friendly rival co-worker. Yeah, I think she thinks of it as, like, he'll, he'll get drunk and start talking shit at the office party yes. at Christmas. But yes, you, you, have, you have stopped me making a grave mistake in forgetting the entire second half of the chapter. Because <laughs> um, the next day, Harry's... Or we skip ahead to when Harry's wand arrives. Uh, Wand? Broom. We skip ahead to two. when no, Harry's broom We have arrives. not one, but two sticks now. <laughs> yes. Um, and, like, everyone's really impressed, and Draco, like, they, they get into it, as they have done for every other fucking sentence in these last few chapters. Um, but this time it boils over, and Malfoy challenges Harry to a midnight magic duel. We don't really get much detail about what that entails, besides the fact that you have to choose, like, someone to take over if you die. <laughs> and, you know, Ron, Ron, Ron's a bro. He steps up to the plate. Oh, yeah. So, later that night, they set about sneaking out. Uh, Hermione. The fucking... Ah, oh, the swat she is. She, like, <laughs> knew about this, and she waited for them, and she was going to tell them off and make them go back to their rooms, but... Uh, the portrait ghost is missing and they're all locked out. Mm-hmm. So she's kind of along for the ride. And they also just find Neville lying in a corridor because he got locked out. <laughs> still still nursing a broken wrist. I would be so... I The version of this where Malfoy wasn't fucking with them and wasn't, like doing the shuffle on them <gasps> where Harry turns up to Keep the spoilers. Harry turns up to the midnight duel and he's got both Hermione and Neville in tow. <laughs> <laughs> it's the just squad. like what you're just like I know, I just acquired these as I made my way here. Neville's life is truly pain. This poor eleven year old just sleeping on a cold castle floor <laughs> with a broken wrist. <laughs> Jesus. No, his wrist has been healed. His wrist is fine. It probably still hurts. Probably not. not probably not over it. No, I mean, okay, emotionally, I'm sure he's traumatized many times over. But you know, his wrist is his wrist is healed. It's not that hard to heal a broken wrist. Peeves keeps throwing shit at him. Yes. Rats. Bats. Cats. Wizard chats. All right, anyway. <laughs> we keep going. So, yeah, so the... We got three episodes in before bringing that one up. So, Anyways. the Midnight Duel is... And I actually, I respect Draco's hustle here. Like, 
That, that, mm. Like, it, it's not that complicated or that sophisticated. Like, you know, it's a very simple, like, Harry's already on kind of thin ice with the teachers, and so we're going to yeah. set him up to get in, in, into even more trouble with this midnight duel. And I know that he will... Gives him a razzle-dazzle. Right, and it's like a gambit based on the assumption that Harry will definitely do this because he wants to be my rival. So- <laughs> Wait, what you gotta say? Pretty good read of Harry so far. He has got a little bit of an ego on him. He has got, like, a, you know, a bit of a pride. He does! Yeah, I think part of that comes from, like, he's never been in the position in his life where he could like compete with someone on kind of an, an, an as an equal like it was like with Dudley it was just like running in terror uh like he he could like like whenever he if you get into any kind of physical altercation with Dudley Harry loses and yeah with with Draco it's kind it's fun to have a rival that he can beat and mm. he likes you know doing that I mean that's that's the Gryffindor he likes doing the Doing the hero thing, doing the proven himself thing. Uh, yeah. I think it's like, at this point, uh, Harry hasn't so much got a, like uh, arrogance about him, but I think he has realized he's kind of hot shit. I think, yeah, he's... yeah he He's feeling himself. Yeah, he is. Which is not... That, like, given how, like, riddled with insecurity he was when he arrived, I'm like, yeah, good for him. Uh, and... I like how, like, he and Ron kind of, like, he's, like, he's feeling himself a bit, he, he still has, like, the riddled with insecurity aspect. And, like, mm. where he's kind of imagining, like, oh, I have to go do this duel because I can see Malfoy's smug face when I close my eyes. And that is, like, that, that I think that comes from the same place in him as the insecurities. Yeah. I think it's, it's funny how, like, he really hates Crab and Goyle for, like, being Malfoy's goons. But, I mean... What is Ron but his goon? <laughs> Ron's always gassing him up as well. It goes both ways, Harry. It's a, uh, yeah, I, like, we see why Harry and Ron have the bond that they do. How, like, they, they are stuck like glue. Like, very, like, they get very tight, very close. Uh, hmm. or very quickly. And I guess that is kind of realistic for kids at school. Like, you find your buddy... Like, everybody find your exit buddy, and they found their exit buddy, and now we are friends forever, because, you know, you, you need a friend. Um, yeah, like, you know, you got Harry and Ron, and by the end of these chapters, Adam and Hermione, you got Draco, Crabbe, and Goyle, and of course, Neville and Seamus F- Finnegan? Uh, right, Neville, oh, yeah. I, okay, this is something uh, to mention, we were sort of losing track of, like, the story we were, like, the, the summary part, but that's probably a good thing. Uh, but yeah, so a thing I wanted to mention was that I like how the rest of the class doesn't vanish when stuff mm. is going on with Harry. Like, the other character, like, his classmates are present, and you have, like, Seamus Finnegan. Uh, like, there's a moment during the Snape standoff where while Snape is bullying Harry and Harry has his little cheeky moment, Snape kind of, uh, yeah, not Snape, Seamus Finnegan gives him a kind of smile and wink from the side. And it's Seamus who does that, not Ron, who you expect to be like, oh, Ron's his friend. But no, Seamus is also, because Seamus shows that the rest of the class is also like, yeah, we we also think that Snape is being unfair to you. Um, Seamus represents the people. Yeah, she- Seamus is voice of the people. Uh, and like during the, in the flying lessons, Harmony Patil is someone who stands up for Neville. And then she's countered <laughs> by her own uh, Slytherin bitch, Pansy Parkinson. And yeah, Pavadi Patil versus Pansy Parkinson. Parkinson. Oh, thank you, thank you, Rowling. You've really <laughs> done it again. Yeah, and like <laughs> really hit, uh, really hit me with those cinematic parallels. And. With like Parvi and Seamus are barely character like they're side characters, but you don't I don't know, you, you get the sense that they're part of a community and it's not just kind of like the main character and his immediate friends in isolation in the school. Um And I don't know, I, I like that. And I feel like I don't know, that, that that's one of those things that gets a little bit missed in the movies. Like well, the Seamus Finnegan, I know, he's kind of been reduced to in the movies. Uh, they kept they kept it coming back as a joke that he blows things up, and yeah, Oof. and 
Oof. Yeah, you you know why that's a yeah. Uh, but th- before we, like, we could go on about that. But the thing is, is that in the books, it's just one thing. And it's not even... I, I don't think it was intended to be that in the books because it's just Harry happens to be with him for Charms. He, like, Harry gets paired with him in Charms class and Seamus, like, accidentally lights his thing on fire. But just, like, it's part of a list of a bunch of ways that people are fucking up because no one can do it right except for Hermione. And I think that's a, mm. that, like... In another bit where Seamus was working with Neville, Neville was the one who melted their cauldron, not Seamus. So it's just I don't know. Like that, that was just that, that was a, that's movie's fault. Seamus is fine. Justice for Seamus. <laughs> uh, also, I think he's gay. But anyway, yeah. I mean the movies that you know he he's involved in like the flying car getting destroyed. For some reason, he's in a post office that blows up. Is <laughs> it's it's really out of hand. <laughs> he had a bucket. <laughs> But yeah, um, just lurching to the end of this chapter, like, yeah, they've been set up by Malfoy. Um, he's told Finch that there's going to be students sneaking around where they're headed, where they agreed to have the duel. And they have like a Scooby-Doo style chase um, into a locked room, which turns out to be the Forbidden Corridor, um, inside of which is a giant free headed dog. Uh, who is like standing over a trapdoor? <laughs> they sort of. I was a bit. I was a bit confused as to like. They say that they caught the dog by surprise, and then they just kind of leave the room again. <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, okay, <laughs> sure." I think it's like she realized that none of them really know any magic by this point, so there's no way out of the scenario besides just like running the comedy beat of opening the door, seeing something scary, and being like, "Oh." Close yeah, she doesn't have them scream, which I think she like if they scream, yeah. they would have attracted, they would have gotten caught, and they can't get caught, so they don't scream. In the movies, they they have like an ah moment, which might mm. be better. I don't know. I think it's it's really like they open the door, they're like over here. Oh God, what the f-? like they don't. Of course, of course, the movies expand this segment by adding a corridor full of different doors where they all move through one door and they're being chased by the dog and the dog comes out, like, chasing only a few of them and sometimes they come out carrying the dog <laughs> and it's all very funny. It's very amusing. Yes. But unfortunately, like, the books don't quite have the breath that a visual medium does, so we, we didn't get that scene. And it's a, a jamming bit of surf rock playing. Yes. Uh, but yeah, three-headed dog. <laughs> then they, they, they just like, oh, sorry to bother you, leaves. Uh... <laughs> Uh, yeah, they just and they just kind of go back to their dorm room. Finch doesn't catch them. Nice one. Uh, even with, like, Peeves trying to rat them out. This is the whole fucking thing of, like, Peeves, like, he, he, he tattles on them. Finch is like, ah, oh, Peeves, tell me where they go. Oh, I won't tell you anything if you don't say please or some shit like that. Where it's like a, mm-hmm. like a double negative yeah and he's like oh i tricked you and he fucking fucking leaves peeves peeves is chaotic evil and he's great uh uh peeves just peeves is just like here's fucking dennis the menace because he's it's just the most dumb pranks in the world yes (laughs) i just looked at there of like a malicious spirit who's just like fucking tripping you over and like putting buckets on top of doorways <laughs> yeah he's not clever he's just con- he, he's just always putting ketchup putting ketchup packets underneath the fucking toilet seats like ah, uh, like god damn it peeves get new material like fucking <laughs> <laughs> uh. Peeves, like, leaves people's... Sh- he, like, doesn't get people to eat shoehorns anymore, so he, like, hides them all and wonders why no one's that bothered. Anyway, anyway, but yeah, thing under trap door. We already talked about thing under trap door, and Hermione's the one that notices it. And this was a change from the movies. Uh, this was, like... Ooh. this. We haven't talked a ton about Ron this chapter, aside from that he's kind of Harry's stooge. But, Ron, but in the movies, they have that line where... Or I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that they changed that line. Because it makes uh, somebody sound like they weren't paying attention. And so, where Harry's like, oh, I wasn't... Where's Harry, in the books, Harry is like, I wasn't looking at its feet, I was too busy with its heads! I'm, I'm pretty sure that Ron gets that line in the movies. Because mm. it's like Hermione knows something that you didn't, Ron, uh, instead of, like, Harry. In the books, actually, Harry, or at least so far, but of the two of them, 
Harry is more likely the one to be doing, like, the action thing, and then Ron will provide a counterpoint of noticing something. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, we also get, speaking of Hermione, we do get the absolute banger line. We could have all been killed, or worse, expelled. <laughs> and I, I love that line because, like, a young Emma Watson doing that in the first movie, you can tell she is just, she is chuffed to bits with her read on that one. Yes. That was, like, that was, like, the peak of filming for her. <laughs> that was when Hermione was born. But yes, that is chapter nine. Uh, we, we, we're introducing a bit of non-linear storytelling at this point. That's... Because <laughs> the event... That's fine. Chapter ten, Halloween. Um, I like how Halloween is, like... It's kind of got like an apostrophe between the two E's at the end of it. Mm. Kind of like an oldie, oldie English way of saying it. Hallo- Brings to mind the whole Voldemort discussion from the first episode. Yes, Halloween. Hallo- Halloween? I guess you would just say it the same way. But yeah, All Hallows Eve. This chapter's relatively short. We start off with Malfoy being, ah, his schemes have been once again fucking unraveled. Boiled! Thanks to those meddling kids and their stupid dog too. And I, I like the like this is like at the bit this is part of the, like the attitude that Harry and Ron take after is they're like oh we gotta get Malfoy back for this but they also they're like it's almost in an affectionate way like it, it's it's like we we were not resentful towards Malfoy for what he attempted to do because we thought this was a great adventure it was just like oh now we gotta get him back uh, and yeah you know, it, it's it's. Like a it's it's petty rivalry that is great fun for everyone involved. He's caught on to the rock cake bit. He stopped eating them after the second one. <laughs> <laughs> no, he gave one to Crab and Crab just ate it. <laughs> yeah, Crab digested it. <laughs> Crab, 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 of course, comes from a, a wizarding family of mountain trolls. So he can digest that stuff. But yeah. Um, we kind of we kind of covered a lot of what happens at the start of this mm-hmm. chapter already. Harry gets his new uh, broomstick. He gets like his first Quidditch induction with Wood, and the rules are explained to him. Um, we could skip over that part because, frankly, it makes about as much sense not knowing the rules as it does knowing the rules. <laughs> yeah, Her- Hermione's not happy. She's been kind of uh, talked down to by Ron and Harry this entire chapter, and kind of. We're starting to reach the peak of it, especially because um, I believe like they have a lesson together. Like, uh, which one is it? Wingardium Leviosa. It's charms. That's it. Yes, yes. They have a the famous Wingardium Leviosa uh, scene where like they're having charms class. It's Leviosa. And it's Leviosa, not Leviosa. I do. I do feel for Ron in this scene because this is how I feel when like Pasha is trying to correct how I say stuff. Hmm. Like, this is a complete tangent, but uh, I have trouble, like, pr- correctly saying my actual name. I say it Matthew, and you're supposed to say it with more of a TH noise. That, but, that is some bull- It's your name, it's pronounced how you say it. Fuck these people. I once got a card from this right dick of a kid where he'd spelt it M-A-F-E-W. Oh, the little shit. <laughs> but yeah, um, I can relate to Ron being frustrated at, like... Uh, Reason number 236 not to go to Hogwarts, diction matters. Oh god, actually, yeah, that never occurred to me as a kid. Re- and that, now you two bring it up. No, yeah, fu- that, that is some, that is some hogwash. What the fuck? Like, given- God, god forbid you're a northern kid at Hogwarts, Jesus. Yeah, that, that, that is, like, given how, like, it's boarding school world. And it has a lot of the, mm. the perils of boarding school world. It is also like anti what those things were with like Tom Brown school days and what those were like they were it was boarding school to teach kids how to be good little uh you know, builders of empire. And yeah. Harry Potter is much more like this is boarding school for the freaks. This is boarding school for the weirdo wizards, this is boarding school where nothing like that. You know. It's boarding school where it's okay to be weird. Yeah, and I know that's, like, you, you say that, it's like, this is Harry Potter. It isn't really even freakish. It's like, okay. But you gotta remember, this is, you know, when you're 11, it's cool. And it's like, mm. you know, like, like Hogwarts is 
chaos boarding school. You know, like all like it's not about everything being super conformed. It's about you know the stairs are constantly moving and there's a poltergeist that's just around and you know like our sport instead of being you know rugby or cricket it's rugby cricket with a golden snitch just for fun and our money makes no god like you think your money's insane wait till you get wizard money <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like with it being chaos boarding school the fact that diction matters is strikes me as oh. kind of bullshit. Um, Northern Hogwarts student Wingardium Leviosa. Mm. What's happening, sir? Well, no, he would actually get it right because it's Levi. It is Leviosa. What it isn't is Leviosa. Uh -huh. So maybe actually being a Southern because Hogwarts. Are, okay, this is. Da -da 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 -da. I've been. I actually said <gasps> this wrong earlier. And you did not correct me. So I am a dumb American, but you are. You have failed to Brit pick me, which is that. Oh, I said, I referred to Hogwarts as being in England, which it is not. It is in Scotland. Oh, I don't know if that's come up yet, actually. Oh, maybe it hasn't been said explicitly, but that's where they are. They're in the Highlands. Uh, like, oh. that is that is what it is. And that's not, like, a, a, a later canon thing. That's, like, yeah, that is, like, when, they, when the okay. environs are described and everything, that's where they are. So, in that case, Hogwarts has actually got an anti-London bias. It's actually based. It's it's actually based. Hogwarts said... J.K. Rowling did not say Scottish uh, independence, but Hogwarts did. The, the fucking... The Beatles would be the greatest wizards of a generation. <laughs> a Scouse accent actually makes you especially good at magic. But yeah, um, because Hermione is sort of just being such a know-it-all and kind of... To be fair to her, she's not a snitch. She tells them not to do shit, but she never rats them out for yeah, it. Yeah, she threatens to, but she doesn't actually do it. Yeah, she's, she, she she gets, like, you know, honor among thieves. But yeah, like, uh, that really starts pissing off Ron, and he says something hurtful and passing to her, and she unfortunately uh, gets quite upset and heads to the girls' bathrooms to have a cry. Which, you know, Hermione... I've been there. Yeah, it's all right. same. Yeah, but um, during dinner that night, Professor Quirrell comes just flying into the fucking uh, Great Hall to announce there's a troll in the dungeons. There's some trolls in this dungeon. I why did that not become? And we're not talking about Snape. Ah! Oh, this. <laughs> so this is a thing to note. I don't know if this is. I don't know if she knew that Slytherins live in the dungeon yet uh but snape is in the dungeon so i think probably like the slytherin common room is in the dungeon that's where the, the slytherin house lives and so quirrell comes in there's a troll in the dungeon and dumbledore's like ah oh, yes prefects take your students to their common rooms <laughs> and i don't think this is like, I, this might be a bit of an oversight on Rowling's part, but I think this is fine as canon. Dumbledore just forgot. <laughs> Dumbledore forgot. Oh, this is an act of act. This is like active malice. <laughs> I don't know what the Slytherins do instead. Maybe they just stay in the Great Hall. Yeah. To be honest, it would have made more sense for everyone to just stay in the Great Hall. Honestly, yeah. yeah. Just like batten down that, like, stay in the Great Hall leave some teachers in the Great Hall to defend it, and then send the rest of the teachers out to deal with the troll. This, you know, this is the issue with these, like, private magical institutions, is they end up being immune to oversight oversight boards. And that's why you can have a student fatality rate of 5% and get away with it. <laughs> I, I don't think it's just 5%. <laughs> but anyway, keep going. That's why... It that's why, you know, every so often a second year gets smashed into a pancake by a troll with a giant club and no one really bats an eye. Anyway, but yeah, so turns out the troll is not in the dungeon, is the thing. Oh, I got a little bit, like, uh, I got a little bit spatially confused. I know it's, it, where it actually is, is the girls' bathrooms. Yes. Because Ron and Harry are running over to try and, like, warn Hermione about this. She doesn't know. Mm -hmm. Um... And they, in the process, managed to lock the troll into the girls' bathroom. Now, Reba, I think what actually is in the girls' bathroom right now is ideology. Oh, dear. Oh, okay, this is... You, you have your thing to say about this. So, 
you mentioned this to me that this occurred to you before you read the chapter having now read the chapter mm. what what are your what t- tell us your tell us your takes so i think as we all know like unfortunately jk rowling has expressed a lot of publicly transphobic beliefs under the guise of like protecting women from predatory men who might be pretending to be transgender in order to like get access to women's spaces like that, that, that is that is what she says she is afraid of and that is the um yeah that, that is the boogeyman she she and transphobic feminists have invented for themselves yeah mm. and it's like important to just stay like i'm aware that people listening to this are probably fully aware of this fact that's nonsense there is no evidence supporting that and it's really just a line to like deny trans people access to basic utilities. Yeah, in life. we've alluded to I think how we feel about like Rowling's whole situation before. Uh, but yeah, to to be explicit, yeah, tra- uh, trans rights are human rights. Trans liberation now. Uh, Rowling's turf bullshit is bullshit. Bu- bullshit of turfs. <laughs> <laughs> um. I think this troll in the bathroom scene is interesting because although it doesn't... I think at this point she doesn't directly, like, hold those beliefs she holds now about, like, these anxieties about bathroom invaders, I think it does kind of inform us, like, this is probably where it comes from. Like, this scene in one of her first and, like, most important books featuring, like, a young girl being threatened by a a fucking huge hulking creature in the toilet... I think does kind of speak to a general anxiety mm. we have as a culture that is like, I think that is, it, it's more that like we have this, we have this view that like we expect these things that don't really happen, these like violent attacks that are much more uncommon than like where the real abuse tends to happen, which is from people you know. And we over police and we end up cracking down on the rights of women and girls to prevent them. And I think it's just interesting to note that, like, this anxiety from the wrong place that ends up, like, hurting the people that you want to protect is already kind of showing up here. Okay. I don't think you can draw a direct line between, like, her current views in this scene, but I do think it's interesting to kind of see, like, this is perhaps where some of it stems from. Mm, or like, yeah, that you can see, like, what 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 is Rowling anxious about? I believe that she is sincerely afraid of the boogeyman of the troll in the woman's bathroom, and yeah, this is like, I, I okay, I, I can kind of see like this is like she's crafting this little horror scene. Um, she has her heroine Hermione is in a vulnerable position, and. What 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 is the scene? Well, if she's Hermione is trapped in a bathroom with a monster, um, yeah. So I think I think that doesn't not check out, uh, to some extent. Uh, when when you first told me about this, because you you already because you, you knew about the troll in the bathroom scene, and this occurred to you uh before you read it, and I was like, eh, I mm. don't know, that seems like a reach, or that seems like like if Rowling wrote this scene now, it would be like, ah, okay, this is obviously what this is. But looking back, I was like, okay, yeah. this is like this was not top of anybody's mind back then. But I could see how it does kind of like it it's you know, it's like your Jungian subconscious. You can see that kind of thing surfacing. Yes, yeah. Yeah. You kind of, yeah, you kind of hit onto like what I was trying to get at of like I think this scene is pretty innocuous in and of itself, but it's very much like we see how maybe like a understandable anxiety has over time been turned into, like, a way to just lash out and hurt a vulnerable group. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, to, to the scene itself, um, uh, what thoughts on the scene? Because this is the big, like, Harry, Ron, Hermione come together scene. Um, uh, the scene's fun. I think we do also get, like, a little bit of, like, Rowling's kind of a bit clunkier when she's writing action mm-hmm. scenes and when she's writing scenes of us just sort of getting around the locale but i think it like it moves pretty quickly you have a pretty good sense of what's going on um they don't really overcome the troll by like overpowering it they outsmart it which feels you know kind of kind of classical story the bigger they are the harder they fall stuff 
and I I like that this is kind of the moment where they become friends with Hermione. Mm-hmm. I like that it's it's almost like they just re- come to realize that they do care about her more than she apologizes for who she is. Yeah, I think that's nice. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, like they've both been kind of shitty to each other in different ways, but they have both ex- like. Her, like, bugging them has come from a place of caring. And yeah. they before had not been, like, appreciating that at all. And, like, in her, like, how they defeat the troll, like, she's she's kind of a damsel in that scene, but they're able to do it because Ron takes her advice and listens to what she had mm. told him earlier about how to say Leviosa. So, yeah, like, it's... Yeah, so, and then, and then she, uh, you know, the, respects the honor among thieves and doesn't rat them out. Um, I think it's funny that she says the thing about, like, she said she lies and says that she wanted to fight the troll on her own. Yeah. Which is like, well, that's, you don't have to, you don't have to like, rat yourself out like that. That's just a well, lie. Well, I think that she did that because, <laughs> okay, the other thing was going to be, why, the, why were we in the bathroom with the troll? How did this happen? Uh, well, mm. what happened is that I was crying in the bathroom, and then they came to find me, and then they accidentally, they, they were idiots, and they locked the troll in the bathroom with me, and then they realized what they had done, and then they came to, uh, and then they, they defeated the troll. Um, but that is, that doesn't paint either of them in especially good lights, and it makes her sins, uh, instead of her sin- like, she was crying in the bathroom because of the mean things Ron had said to her. I think it's implied that, like, it's Ron, but it's also, like, the student body in general. Hermione has no yeah. friends. And that's why yeah. she's crying in the bathroom. And, I don't know, I kind of wonder... Like, I think like, like I think that, like, she, she tells a lie because she didn't want to say that they locked the troll in the bathroom with me. Because um, that would not help their case. <laughs> <laughs> if one would be funny. Right. Uh, it also makes her seem like, okay, this is like an anecdote from my own childhood. And this is actually related to Harry Potter. Um, but for the longest time when I, I refused to read the Harry Potter books, and when people would ask me why, I, would, I told them I didn't want to read them because I thought they were too scary. That wasn't true. I didn't want to read them because I knew that they were popular, and I didn't want to do the popular thing. But I knew if I said that, mm. if I admitted that I didn't, I was doing something because I wasn't doing something because it was popular, that would make it seem like I cared what people thought about me. And so instead, between the two vices, I preferred to have people think of me as cowardly than to think of me as someone who cared what other people thought of me. Uh. So I think, I don't know, maybe one thing of this is that Hermione would prefer to be thought of as someone who would do a stupid, brave thing than to someone, than as someone who would be crying in a bathroom. I mean, uh, not to get all, like, English English university course on you, but, like, looping back to what you said last episode about the house being sort of not only what you are, but what you aspire to, Hermione's aspiring to be brave. Yes, exactly. Yes, we get it, we get it, yes. Hermione wishes that she'd been the sort of person who would go after a mountain troll the way that Harry and Ron did. And I think that's part of why she likes them is because they do like this stuff is stupid, but it's kind of the sorts of stuff that she like would want to be able to do. Yeah. 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 She wants to be, she wants, she wants to be dumber. <laughs> I mean, if you play Quidditch for a few years, you, you, you'll, you'll, you'll get, you'll get there. It'll, it'll knock a few, knock a few brain cells out of there. Yep. Join the Quidditch team. All right. Uh, uh, once again, McGonagall reinforces reckless and bad behavior by giving them a, a gross total of five, a net total of five house points for attempting to fight a mountain troll. <laughs> well, for successfully fighting a mountain troll, they lost points for attempting to, but they gained points for successfully doing it. You know, I love the idea of, like, if McGonagall saw you, like, I don't know, like, fucking trying to do a motorcycle jump over a pit of sharks, she'd be like, mm, <laughs> minus five points because that was stupid, but plus ten points because that was pretty sick. <laughs> yeah, McGonagall, 
Like, she's the stern one. Is she, though, really? Uh, <laughs> Headcon and fairy. McGonagall loves the X Games. All right. She, oh, yeah, that, she's a huge Tony Hawk fan. But so, yeah, so that takes us to the end of these chapters that we have read. Uh, <laughs> McGonagall and Hooch do a wizard jackass together. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, that, that's that's the end of the chapters. All right. Uh, is there anything you want to wrap up about what we've what we've read so far? No, I think we covered our bases. We 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 we've got to get into our extracurriculars. Yes, extracurriculars. All right. Uh, the no the first thing is who is the chosen one? Who is your favorite character of the week? Because and we got a load of new characters this round, load of side characters really, uh, and development of the ones that we already had. Uh, but of them, who is the standout performance? So I do got to give a quick shout out to my boy Flitwick, but he doesn't really do enough to justify giving him it this chapter. Okay. I am going to give it to our favorite adrenaline junkie, uh, Professor McGonagall. Okay, <laughs> yes. I think, um, yeah, I just think she gets a lot of strong characterization, a lot that you can take in a fun, a funny direction, if you ask me. Yes. And she comes across as, like, an interesting, pretty multidimensional person here. Yeah, like, she's not simply, like, the stern teacher. She's got other sides to her, uh, which, I mean, we, we talked about that. But, yeah, she's, you could have had her be just, like, the very teacher. But, you know, she's, I think this is why people love her. Or why people, like, I yeah. mean, guess, like, you kind of latch on, latched onto her early on is because she has this kind of, like, fun to her. Uh, for my character of the week, for my chosen one, it was, okay, I was debating between, like, who do I like more? Uh, Draco as a rival or Ron as a friend? And that is a Ooh. tough one because they are both extremely suited to their roles. I already talked a lot about Draco um, this time. And I think I think I've kind of talked myself into giving it to him, uh, just because I am so endeared by Draco Malfoy, woman scorned. Uh, uh, the Reba answer. <laughs> okay, I guess, I guess that is the Reba answer. I don't know. I haven't uh, like I've appreciated Brom before. I don't think I've quite appreciated Malfoy before, uh, with mm. his whole deal. So. I do still, like, I, I do want to mention Ron, though, just because, give him credit, there's a lot of, like, people talk about this a lot, where Ron does not get enough credit in the movies, and he gets kind of, he gets overlooked by some sections of the fandom, and he is, he, he's like, I get, to continue our Pokemon comparisons, Ron is like the Rattata, or the like the norm the type, the normal type oh. who, who, jo who hooks up with your starter early on, in the game and, right right or he's like the pidgey and it's like he, he's he's your hm friend he's the one who has like surf strength cut and flat yes yes and he's like you don't appreciate because like he's not particularly so far like he doesn't he's not like particularly smart or particularly strong but he's your friend he's there for you he's yeah. got your back and like you like, he's not an idiot either. Like, a lot of times when he and Harry are talking and they're back and forth, Harry is the more the one who will be a bit more unreasonable and a bit more like he's either anxiety riddled or he might be kind of like charging ahead to prove himself. And Ron has his own like impulses like that, but he can, he counterbalances Harry a bit and he's a bit more down to earth. Like, with the dueling thing, yeah. like, Ron is like, Draco is like, Harry, you will duel me at midnight. And Ron's like, yeah, he will, and I'm his second. And then, <laughs> and Harry's like, "Wait, people die in deals." And Ron's like, "Yeah, but you won't. I mean, you, you we're we're kids. You're just gonna shoot sparks at each other. It's fine. Like, <laughs> he's 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 reasonable. Uh, we're a couple of odd notes, Harry. Yeah. So I yeah. So, so shout out to Ron. Uh, but I think my chosen one has to be Draco, just because of how delightful I found that dynamic uh, in this reading. I mean, Dr you know, Draco's. Draco is, of course, the answer to the question, what if Dudley wasn't a chat? Yes! <laughs> oh, God. D Draco Draco is the, the, the virgin Draco, the Chad Dudley. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... Uh, next extracurricular is the magical moment of the week. 
uh, which is something magical. It can be a detail, it can be a set piece, uh, but it's something that you found inviting or evocative, or this is the reason why wizards should be in hiding. Uh, but yeah, something mm. magical that stood out. Well, Curl's turban full of garlic was pretty magical, but <laughs> <laughs> I think um, the rememberal kind of speaks Ooh. to me as, at least in my head, it would be functionally pretty much useless because <laughs> all it does is tell you that you've forgotten something. And unless you're like incredible at clearing your to-do list, you're always going to have something that you haven't like, haven't remembered to do like right this minute. Yeah, that is such... <laughs> It's such a useless object. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's like in the minute you think like, oh, I ought to like, I don't know, have a look at my home insurance quote when I get home at some point. That rememberal is going to be fucking bugging you about that for weeks. Oh my god. Yeah, that is a like a uniquely useless, but interesting object. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a lot of people have. Uh, on the rememberal, this isn't something that's... I'm not going to tell you the lore for this at all, but I will say that there's stuff with Neville where people have been like, but what if what if he's what he forgot was actually something very important? Uh, that he was, like, memory wiped or something. His social security number. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that, probably not, though. Like, it's just... I, I forget things most of the time. Like, if I had a rememberal, it would just always be telling me, you know, I forgot where I happened to put my phone. And it's just like, oh, where is it? Oh, it's right here. <laughs> uh, my... Uh, fucking Neville having a rememberal in his own version of Memento, where every few hours he forgets everything he does. <gasps> yeah, it's... Yeah. Man, the just let Malfoy keep it if he wants it. Uh, like, <laughs> um, and then you have okay. So my magical moment is I just said I, I was good. I guess you could call like the the changing stairs, but I have in my moats listed as just Hogwarts's bullshit, um, which is <laughs> just like that that whole bit where it describes just like the stairs are constantly changing, the por the people in the portraits are not static, the walls aren't real walls, the stairs aren't real stairs. Like, that is... It's, it's chaos boarding school. And it's... The Hogwarts is chaotic neutral. Key, Peeves is chaotic evil. Hogwarts is chaotic neutral. And it has mm. no... It gives no fucks about you getting to class on time. And you will not. It is. <laughs> it doesn't give fucks about you getting to class a lot. No! Yeah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I... That is... It's... Like, that's part of why I think Harry Potter does manage to feel cool when you're reading it. Because it's not... It's still keeping that kind of roll doll energy where the world is exciting, but not necessarily friendly. Uh, like, you have to learn to work with Hogwarts because Hogwarts will not try to work with you. I think that's... So that's pretty good for like the magical moments. Yeah, and now we have uh, our peak Rowling moment, which some weeks were strong for this one, some weeks were not. Uh, will you say that this is a strong peak Rowling moment? We had we had the troll in the dungeon. Uh, we had the troll. In the gender dungeon. theory essay. Uh, would would is that your peak Rowling moment, or is there anything else to make note of? There's a serious answer, which is like, yeah, I. Besides the yucks, I think like there is an interesting thing going on with the troll in the dungeon moment in general. Um, but the fun answer is, of course, when describing Snape, his eyes are, they were cold and empty and made you think of dark tunnels. And that's a mm, banger of a simile. That doesn't work for you? <laughs> <laughs> It's like it's like something you would write when your teacher is first teaching you about the concept of a simile and you haven't quite gotten the format yet. Okay. Like you haven't quite got the idea. Where it's like, no no, you can just say it's like a dark tunnel. You don't have to specify like all the rest. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, okay. Like that that they are like dark tunnels is good. That they are cold and dark like dark tunnels is Oh, uh, yeah, it's the cold and dark and make you think of. Yes, that made you think. 
there's a lot here where she'll just kind of spell things out. I think my peak rallying, um, okay, well, the, the one, one thing that I was going to say is that the troll's feet are described as having, as being, he has horny feet, and I blame mm. rallying for making me think that describing something's feet as horny was an acceptable thing to do. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck, you've really outdone me. That's way better than my one. <laughs> okay. Okay, I... Damn It's it. just... I... Well, okay, I, I did... Because I did this then when I wrote Harry Potter fanfiction as a wee middle schooler. And there was at one point where there's like a... Like some... No, it's a, it's a gnome that turns up. I... I'm not going to explain the context for this, but there was like some kind of magical creature I described as having horny feet because I thought that was okay because I thought that was a normal <laughs> thing to do. And it is not uh, in retrospect. Your parents really, your parents really gave me a shoulder like, what the fuck? Oh, they didn't read my shit. No, 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 no. But <laughs> thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Um, my, I'm going to try and throw this out. There's like a last, a last minute, like, Oh my goodness, is that Rowling's music? When they fucking pull the wand out of the nose and Harry goes, Oh, troll bogeys. Is that is is bo- is uh, that not a thing to say? No, that is. It was just like it was very like I could hear like the fucking like comedy sting of that one. Mm, yeah, 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 you're right. It does have a little Yeah, and it is I feel like comedy is a hard thing to aim for. I think she, when she, she yeah. can get it well, like stuff like the litter sequence or even things like, you know, like in this whole bit, like whenever she describes, like how, like, like r- how Malfoy was like, he couldn't believe his eyes that Harry and Ron were still like at Hogwarts. <laughs> like there's a, well, the done to there's a lot in this chapter that I thought was good comedy. Uh, but yeah, there's a bit where it's just kind of like, eh, we like we're tooting on clown horns over here and it's a little bit too much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> real like Harry mugging to camera. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. With, like Will Smith style, like oh troll boogies. Um, <laughs> it's because it's written in the nineties. <laughs> all right. I think yeah, that's all our bases covered. Yeah, that We've done all the wraps homework. up everything. Uh, so next time we are covering. I think we're gonna stick with the three chapter program. Uh, from here on out, yes. that seems to be working. Uh, sometimes they're a little long, but sometimes they're a little short. All right, so next time we got The Mirror of Erised, Nicholas Flamel, and Norbert the Norwegian Ridgeback. Ah. Ah. That's, that's, a colorful, that's a colorful collection of chapter titles. Yes. Oh, Mirror of Erised, that's going to be that's gonna be a very good one. Uh, I'm mm. looking forward to that one because, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. So, uh, we've been your hosts, uh, Matt Muggle Saint, most, voted most likely to forget to do this bit until the end of the podcast. <laughs> um, you can find me online at PRP Gecko. I'm doing, I've got a few things which I'm working on, but as of right now, I mostly just tweet bullshit. Mm. So if you want to see some bullshit. All right. And I'm Reba Mac and Cheese. That's Reba Mac and Cheese. And you can find, you can find uh, my stuff if you Google True Hans Soul Rebel. That's True Hans Soul Rebel. You'll see the stuff that I have worked on. And actually, shortly, uh, I'm going to... You know, I do writing and illustrating things uh, for fun. And I think that I'm going to be doing some kind of illustrated title card. So whenever you get this thing next, that's going to be my art that's up there. Uh, thanks again for joining us uh, please 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 if you enjoyed this episode tell your friends tell your family tell your house elf uh, every view helps and like spreading us around hopefully we should be looking into like getting this hosted on platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts but in the meantime you can always find the newest episodes on the YouTube page which will be set up for this episode yes this is the the episode before but pending where we 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 get our shit together (laughs) yeah so thanks again for listening and mischief mischief managed